So, David, I wanted to start with you just to give us a lay of the land on the scope, the size, what we're facing. Great. Thanks very much. It was a really inspiring morning, so thank you very much for giving me the chance to be part of it. I think there are two aspects of the refugee crisis that you have, in, have to have in mind. One is the scale, and I do think it's important to maintain a sense of the distinction between someone who's fleeing to save their life and someone who's fleeing for a better life. And in international law, never mind in uh, practice around the world, the rights of refugees have been hard won. And so people from Syria and Afghanistan and Somalia, the kind of places and people that we serve, the numbers of people who are fleeing conflict is 65 million. That's the figure to have in your mind. 25 million of them are refugees, and 40 million of them are displaced inside their own country. So, for example, one of the greatest crises at the moment, a forgotten crisis, is in northeast Nigeria. Two and a half million people displaced from their own homes by conflict, but they're internally displaced. They're not refugees. And how many so, are in camps? So, just, just, yeah. come, come. so the first thing to have in mind is the scale of the crisis. 65 million people, one in every 120 people on the planet, the 21st largest country, if it was a country, 24 people per minute displaced from their homes by crisis and conflict last year. The second thing to have in mind, and the second aspect of the crisis, and this is what creates the opportunity for the private sector to make a distinctive contribution, is the mismatch between the assumptions of public policy that underpin help for refugees and the reality of refugees' life. So the assumption of public policy is refugees are in camps, mm -hmm. but 59% of refugees are in urban areas, not in camps. The assumption of public policy is that refugees need help for a short period of time until they go home, because that was... After the Second World War, that was the assumption. In fact, less than 1% of the world's refugees went home last year. So that means issues like education and employment become absolutely key because we're talking about displacement for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. And the third and most gruesome thing to have in mind is the assumption of public policy is that the players in war are governed by Geneva Conventions about how war should be conducted. And I'm afraid the tragedy today is not just that many of the places that we work have ISIS, Al-Qaeda, various other armed opposition groups in control. Increasing numbers of governments aren't living up to the laws of war, never mind armed opposition groups. So eight of our hospitals in Libya have been bombed by Syrian or Russian forces this year. So we, the third aspect of this is that we need to find wholly new ways to give people protection at a time when the law is not being observed. And it's that twin aspect of the crisis, the scale and the changing nature, that means that the old answers, and the old answer above all being just pay more money, on its own is not enough. We need really radical innovation in the way in which we deliver services to people in great need over quite a long period of time. And so we want to get into some of that long-term help. But I, let me ask you, are you trying to, you're distinguishing, as, as many people do, between people uh, fleeing from economic crisis and people fleeing from conflict. Do you think this organization, this crowd, should focus on the conflict portion? Well, I mean, this is obviously totally self-serving because I'm, uh, I'm, my organization is founded by Albert Einstein to, uh, in 1933 to help rescue people who are afflicted by war. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we speak to people whose lives are shattered by conflict and disaster, and it's this fast-growing uh, aspect of the population. My own view, and there's a debate about this, but my own view is that the rights that international law gives to refugees and the obligations that international law places on states in respect of refugees are right. It's right that someone who is forced from their home by a barrel bomb that drops on their house in Daraa and forced to go to, Le to Jordan, that that person has greater rights in international law mm. than someone who decides to leave Montenegro to go mm. to Germany because they want to improve their standard of living. It's not that one is good and the other is bad. It's not a value judgment of that kind, but it's a normative judgment that recognizes that if you're forced to flee from your home by political persecution or fear of death, the global community owes you in a way that an economic, uh, 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 an economic migration it puts you in a different uh, position. And I think that maybe to pick up something that Larry said this morning, I see the question of how we provide for refugees and internally displaced people as a question of a global public good. How is that global public good serviced? And the truth is it can't just be serviced by governments. It certainly can't just be serviced by NGOs. We're being pushed into the front line 
in a way that we haven't been before. It needs to be the private sector as well. And when you think about education and employment and the kind of issues maybe we'll talk about today, it's got to be that three-part distinction. And, and I would say that if we erode the distinction, further erode the distinction between refugees and economic migrants, um, there are two consequences. One is that the problem becomes not a 65 million person problem, but a 300 million person problem and becomes daunting. <laughs> and secondly, my experience of politics is that when the issue of refugee flow and immigration gets confused, the politics gets completely out of control. Mm. And the call of compassion that exists for someone who is fleeing a barrel bomb, wh when you lose that sense that they, there is a, something distinctive about that status, then it's worse for all. It's worse for the refugees and it's worse for the migrants as well. But that's a, that's a political judgment, but that's my own sense. LA, you've um, seen firsthand the impact of the refugee crisis on children. Tell us what you're saying. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Great discussion this, uh, this morning. Uh, I was uh, very much in agreement and I thought it was expressed very well with the Monsignor Franco said, everyone could be somewhere else today. Yeah. Everyone could be somewhere else doing their normal business but we chose to be together in this room and the other room. We chose to have a discussion and have a deeper understanding of these issues. And I think we chose it because we feel that we can do something. And if you can do something, you have to do something. So I'll talk a little bit about that. What's uh, the moral imperative to do uh, something? Uh, and I think this is the right time and the right place to talk about that moral imperative. But first of all, who are these people and how many are they? I think sometimes it's difficult to conceptualize how much is 65 million people. Mm -hmm. And don't forget when we talk about 65 million people, half of them are children. That's always the case. There's always a lot of children. I represent Save the Children, a very old organization. We were started in 1919. Our founder came to the Pope uh, the winter of 1919 and uh, asked for help. Uh, to help the children that was completely lost after the First World War, and that's what—that's our foundation. So, he helping refugee children is your foundation. Uh, uh, refugees is your foundation. Helping refugee children is what our founder asked the Pope to do almost 100 years ago. But how many are they? 65 million people. That's uh, the 21st largest nation of the world. If we put them all together, it's the 21st largest nation of the world but it's certainly not the richest, it's one of the poorest nations of, of the world. It is a, it's, a, it's a country, if we imagine this, where uh, you have the fourth lowest attendance in primary school of children. Uh, it is the country where many, many children will die uh, unnecessarily of uh, diseases that we could have prevented. And of course, it's the country where you have the highest rate of child marriage, because that is also uh, a result of, of a refugee status. So that, those are the people we are talking about, 65 million. And I think the next question for us to ask, why, why do we need to help? And what can we do? And I think the most important thing is for me is that a lot of children are affected. They can't do anything about this. Their schools are being bombed. Uh, there's war crown, uh, crime happening. And they are, I mean, the atrocities that happen to children in war are actually, actually unspeakable. So they're innocent people, they have got nothing to do with it. So that's the first I want to say. The second, and David touched upon this, normally we think that children are protected by their families or their state. Some of these people have nothing, not, none of that protection. They might not have their family, and when they're refugees, they automatically do not have a state to protect them. So that is why that step, that, that is a sign to all of us that if there's no state to protect people, we need to step up. And that is part of the moral imperative for what we have to do. And the last thing I want to say about that is where I started. When you have the power to change things, and I think a lot of us in this room actually have that power to come together. We can't solve the whole problem, but we can solve some of it. And when you have that power, you also have a responsibility. And that is why I feel with the next step we have to take is, is not only about demanding states to do something or ask the wealthiest nations to do something, that is also part of it. But it's also asking as corporate leaders, as leaders in general, what can we do together? What can we do if we hold each other's hands and do something together? And if I have time later, I'll give you a few examples of what corporates can actually do 
to get us from A to B to help some real people, some real children, if they are refugees, and I've got many examples of that uh, with me today, I'd like to share them with you later. So that's what we would like to get straight <laughs> to, actually, because um, you know, one of the things that uh, when I talk to people in the, who are helping refugees, you find that they say that companies really aren't very active in this. Mm. The private sector is not. Is that what you're finding, David? That they're the that you you companies that have been on the forefront of some other issues really haven't been on the forefront of the refugee crisis, particularly the, the conflict refugees? Well, I think that it's certainly the case that it's historically been much more comfortable mm -hmm. for corporates to engage in respect of natural disasters like typhoons and hurricanes than it has been to engage in political disasters, which is essentially what wars are. Mm -hmm. But I think there's been an important change over the last year to 18 months. The fact that the Syria crisis seems like a, not just a war without law, but a war without end, and the fact that it spilled over into Europe in such dramatic fashion over the last year, I think has triggered quite a big change. And I think there are some very important uh, things that corporates can do, both as a group and individually. Just a couple of things f for me. First of all, as someone who's new to the humanitarian sector, I came to work for the International Rescue Committee three years ago. Um, what am I then? You're, but yeah. you're uh, a sort of star who's come to, uh, come to, come to help us um, just six months ago, or well, uh, well, nine well. months ago. Um, but the, the, the first thing is, uh, I hear a lot of talk about CSR, corporate social responsibility. Um, what I talk a lot about is corporate social results. And so the first thing I would ask of you is to be really hard-headed about impact and delivery. That's a message that I think really you can help drive through the humanitarian uh, sector. Secondly, uh, don't try and do right outside your organization if you're not doing right within your own organization. And there are tremendous opportunities for you to be an employer of refugees. If, in America, we have 29 offices across the US that are resettling refugees. There's real opportunity for you to do that across the Middle East, across Africa. Um, th th there's a tremendous opportunity. But thirdly, I think that uh, the best kind of corporate partnerships, and some of them are represented in this room, really are 360 degree partnerships, where, you, where your employees are getting involved, where your supply chains are getting involved, where some of your specialist business units like legal or marketing or strategy are giving us uh, support. And also, I mean, it was, I, I hate to say this in the presence of, um, of, of the Cardinal here, but he, he said that you could um, support the Vatican in its fundraising drive. I mean, it, with the greatest respect in the world, I would suggest that the Vatican has greater endowments to support it than some of the NGOs. So I hope you'll also, in addition, <laughs> in addition to, uh, in addition to the, the employees and the specialist departments, don't forget that NGOs like Save the Children or the International Rescue Committee, we're paid by governments to deliver programs, but we're never paid to exist. And the kind of long-term partnerships that we have with some of the corporates in this room help build sustainable institutions. I mean, Heller is globally, I think it's two and a half billion dollars, all of the Save the Children. We're, we're a $700 million organization. We have 13,000 uh, employees and 10,000 staff in 30 countries in the US. These are very difficult places to do business, and your ongoing support for us can make sure that we're really good at being in the front line, not just in the front line. So I'd like to um, divide this conversation. Let's, let's stick to conflict refugee, refugees. Mm -hmm. Let's um, divide it into two populations, those in camps and those in communities, um, because there's different challenges, I think, each. And I, and I want to engage the audience as they talk, and as you have solutions or thoughts or questions, just go ahead and raise your hand and jump right in. Um, but let's start with um, camps. Yeah. Uh, what can the private sector do, or what is the private? What are some, I've heard some um, terrific projects involving technology, for yeah. example. Um, but you, go ahead, Hella. You, you thank talk you very about much. You... I think this is actually best illustrated by some examples. And I know I will offend some people in the room because there'll be some I'm not, I'm not mentioning. But I, <clears throat> I want to give you an example of, of what we do. When you walk around in Rome, hopefully you will have time to do that, you will see a lot of uh, shops, uh, the luxury brand Bulgari. You'll see that sign uh, a lot in, in Rome. You will see that sign also if you come to the Satari camp in Jordan. Because we have a long-standing, it's a five-year-old uh, uh, partnership. Uh, we just renewed it with Bulgari, for example. And with their help, we are delivering education. Uh, we believe that we have reached uh, more than 800,000 children uh, with Bulgari. 
And that's just an example of a permanent partnership where you started, you discuss. It is not only about handing over a check. It actually never is. It's about adding value to each other and also getting the value from, from these corporations that engage themselves with us. So that's a good example. We also have Pearson uh, in the room. Pearson, a, a long-standing education champion, uh, which is, of course, helping us uh, in education, uh, in Jordan as well, but also many other places. Uh, with box standard, what we can do to educate a lot of children, but also we are trying to innovate with Pearson new digital solutions so that children on the move who don't have access to a school can get their education. See, that is a lot of children that we are, we are reaching uh, together, but it's also trying to innovate. Uh, then, of course, we have Johnson & Johnson, who we worked with for a number of years, also in education and many other areas, also for, for, for refugees. But I want to mention other partnerships as well, because it's not only a deliverer of goods we can work with. We work with the Boston Consulting Group, have done for years. What do they help us with? What can they say? say who, which children can they be part of saving? Well, we are a big organization. We need change management sometimes. We need to be sharper in the work, what, how we work. We need to spend more money on the children and less on administration. That is where BCJ, BCGs can come in and, and help us. We have GSK, enormous partnership that's been going on for years. It just had an award. And what do we do with them? Well, they are an amazing supplier of uh, uh, health interventions and vaccines. Uh, we do a lot of health interventions, and we believe that uh, together with, uh, with GSK, we have perhaps reached more than 1.3 million children with actually concrete health interventions. Just a few examples of where that, that underlines that everyone can add value, not only to children, which is in our case what we really want to do, but also to the corporations themselves, where they can maybe innovate, be part of something that is new, but also, we believe a little bit, make sure that all the people that you employ feel that they are part of something that is a little bit bigger than themselves and, so, and perhaps the bottom line. So this is what's in it for the businesses. I, I've spoken to many of these partners and it looks like it gives them enormous uh, pleasure to be part of something that is big um, and that is what uh, uh, these partnerships can, can do. So I invite you all, come along. It's amazing and the, what is really amazing about it is that we can make a real difference for children. And David, you um, talk about going from humanitarian crisis, you didn't want me to use the word rescue because it's in the title of your organization, but rescue aid essentially, moving from that model to something more permanent, lasting, so we're not losing generations of children, for example. How can the people in this room help? I mean, I was just thinking about it. What, what you, I think what you're saying is how do we move from Band-Aid oh, yeah. to there sustainable yeah. interventions? And I think that um, there are two or three ways that the private sector can, can really make a difference. First of all, we love our government funders for some things, but governments aren't great at taking risks. And so the first thing I would say is that um, when we are trying to find new ways of delivering healthcare, if Raj is still here, some of the community health worker um, stuff that we've done around the world. This is illiterate, innumerate health workers and how we uh, help them tackle some basic uh, diseases. Private sector partners have been really key to innovation in uh, that area. So that's important. I think uh, secondly, and we were talking about this at our table, there's a danger the private sector come along and think they've got to invent something new to do something. Our biggest problem in the humanitarian mm -hmm. sector is not the answers we don't know, it's the programs that we know work, but don't get taken to scale oh. because the donor base is so fragmented. We were saying at our table, let's have a summit where the 10 best but underscaled ideas are brought together. Mm -hmm. And the private sector says, look, we'll just back you in taking, instead of helping, there, there are 200,000 children of Syrian origin in Lebanon who get no education. Mm -hmm. right. There are 200,000 in schools for half a day, but 200,000 get no education at all. This is a country where there isn't a war going on. There's no excuse for that kind of uh, failure. We're helping four, four and a half, 4,000 kids this year. We could help 40,000. Uh, and it's a matter of taking things to scale. And I think that scaling point is really important. The, 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 the third and final point is that 
Um, sustainable programs need really secure delivery chains, they need enabling technology, they need proper management. Those are all very, very challenging things. If we're recruiting staff in areas where there's ISIS is in control, we don't want to recruit ISIS into our organization. Right. We want to make sure that our technology isn't raidable by the wrong right. sides. That kind of help, where you're bringing some of your core professional expertise, is really very, very important right. indeed. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, and then I want to get one question yeah. from somebody. Get it ready, because we have to do it quick. <laughs> I feel the pressure of Zoom speaking fast now. First of all, the scale thing is enormously important. It is great to do one project once and say, all right, this is good, and everyone is happy, and the children are smiling, and they're learning something. But it is actually not worth a lot if we can't scale it. So scale is the buzzword, and I think there's so much that you can help us to do that. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to say about this small imperative and what can we, we do, I always feel with refugees, and particularly refugee children, that we have stolen their future, not once, but twice, if that is possible. First, they have to leave everything they know, their home, their families, their country, everything they have to know, that they know. And then we also steal their future by not providing an education to them. There are far too many children who are refugees that never get access to an education. Just in Greece, which is a developed country, we have refugee children that's been out of school for more than one and a half year. This should not happen. We are stealing their future one more time. And that is why concrete help for education projects and a, and a plan and a wish from the whole world that we will make sure that these children get access to education. No child should be out of education more than 30 days. Uh, that is something that I want to try to rally the world around. It is hard. It's a hard ask. Uh, but it is actually a signal to the world, but particularly these children, that we will not steal their future twice. And not to mention the economic and political instability, which runs Absolutely. against the interests of everybody in this room. We haven't even spoken about the economic Do we have a one yeah. quick question or thought right here? Thank you. Uh, sure. <laughs> Thank you both for, for all of your hard work. Um, my question is about work for refugees. I was on the board of CARE for several years. We run refugee camps, and I've been working with refugee populations with Samosource. And by far, the biggest need I hear when I talk to refugee families is work, right? And if you can, if you can find employment for people, they tend to solve those other downstream problems of poverty on their own. However, many of these refugees are, are in countries now that themselves have extremely high unemployment rates. Mm. And those governments, like the government of Kenya, very reasonably says we can't possibly create employment right. for refugees when we have such high unemployment ourselves. And yet the West is pressuring them to, to you know, reduce the restrictions uh, for refugees to yeah. work. So my question to you is how do you convince a person who voted for Donald Trump, who sees refugees as a threat, to you know, vote for policies that allow more refugees right. to work in richer countries? Or how do you convince those poorer countries, maybe through some sort of well, incentives? Well, I, I would recast know, this because sure. we're supposed to be very focused on the private sector. So what can the private sector do sure. to um, Well, to, first to of all, I think it's very important that we, we are very serious about what we spoke about earlier today, that being part of the lab labor market, being part of that community of labor and working, is extremely meaningful to most people. It gives identity, it's very important. I went to Satari camp, and I promise you, Nina, I'll be short. I went to Satari camp. I spoke to this 15-year-old boy, and every morning, his, his father can't work, and he was saying that his father has gone a bit weird because he just sits at home, smokes a cigarette, and he's not the man he used to be. But every morning, this boy, he actually crawls under from, from the camp go out and stand on the corner, they get picked up in a big lorry, get driven out to different workplaces where they work, and God knows what they do and how they earn their money, it's very little money, and come back to the camp in the afternoon. There we have a child-friendly space where they can come to, they can play and they can uh, do, play a bit of football and be, just be boys. And the only thing he wants is to go to school. So I was thinking, why couldn't it be the father that went out to do that work? I don't know what it is. It should not be the boy. So that's the first thing. Let's get the children in school and the adults to work. The other thing, I've been prime minister, and I've been having to argue that. There was a lot of re refugees that came when I was prime minister, and I think the most meaningful you can say to, your, uh, elect to the electorate and to people uh, is that, isn't it better 
that the people who come to this country, in my case Denmark, that they contribute, that they become part of the community, that they learn the language, that their children come get into schools as soon as possible, because then they would actually be part of paying their own way uh, when they're here. And I think that is very powerful. Um, and it means something in, in Denmark. Uh, I did a big campaign saying, if you're a refugee, you have to work. Uh, and it certainly didn't lose us anything at the election. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a winner because people feel, if you're here, it's all right that you also contribute and it's part of the, uh, the labor market. David, well, uh, final thoughts. Dignity yeah. of work and, again, private sector, what can well, companies the, do? The, the yeah. truth is that at the moment, the humanitarian enterprise is a one-winged aeroplane. It's a wing marked social service. And it's incredibly important. Health, education, protection for women and kids. We've got to grow the second wing, and it's the economic wing of the aeroplane, because otherwise it won't fly. And I was in Jordan last week addressing exactly this point. How do you make it worthwhile for the government of Jordan to champion refugee employment at a time when there's 25% Jordanian mm -hmm. unemployment? By the way, there's also 850,000 economic migrants in Jordan from Egypt, Bangladesh, and elsewhere. So it's a complicated situation. The answer is you make it worth their while. The, this is where the global public good point comes mm -hmm. in. The international financial institutions have got to make it worth the while of Jordan to open up oh. work permits for refugees. And to be fair, this is actually a success story of 2016 because the European Union has promised tariff-free access for Jordanian goods if they employ 15% of refugees. The World Bank has issued a $300 million loan to the government of Jordan on good terms because the World Bank has got interested in fragile states and how refugees are helped. But the key, the reason we were there, we were there actually, I don't want to do advertising for them in competition with uh, BCG, but we were there with McKinsey's. Uh, is Dominic <laughs> here from, is Dominic here yet? Um, McKinsey's have been a, a tremendous partner for us in trying to help the Jordanians think, how do, you, how do you overcome the problem on the supply side that Syrians fear they'll lose their humanitarian benefits if they take a job. That's where we come in. But how do Jordanian firms learn how to grow? That's where McKinsey's come in. That makes it a genuinely impactful partnership. Grow the local And economy. so I think that yeah. my point would be they're going, that there are going to be some generic aspects to the solutions and some local ones. And we should take inspiration that in Uganda, only 1% of the refugees, there's about 700,000 refugees in uh, Uganda, only 1% are wholly dependent on international aid, 23% are partially dependent, 76% are independent because the government of Uganda, whatever else they're doing, they're giving work opportunities and agricultural land to refugees, and the result is they become not just self-sufficient, but contributors to the community. That's the kind of example that we should be seeking to promote. And some of whom go on to stellar futures, from what I'm told. Um, thank you both so much. We're out of time. <laughs>